Dave's going to talk to us about uh, the move to big data uh, with a, a rather provocatively named presentation. Is it still big data if it fits in your pocket? Dave. Thanks, Ken. You, uh, I'm assuming you can all hear me, but I'll watch the chat in case that's not the case. And uh, I actually um, gave a talk some time ago uh, to a, a large database conference, um, and it was about uh, is it still big data if it fits in your pocket? And the idea is that uh, there are a variety of dimensions um, on the big data uh, challenge, and some people you know, define it in terms of velocity, variety, and volume, uh, complexity. Volume is only uh, one aspect of it, and uh, I found that my conversations um, when we w w got into it, a lot of people were focused on simply the scale. Um, so really what I've been doing in the last couple of years here at Microsoft is to try to determine where the new value is in big data um, and uh, looking at those people who have already crossed the chasm and realizing value. Uh, one of the interesting things about working here is that uh, Microsoft's one of a small collection of companies which is actually uh, in the extreme data um, space in that we process hundreds of petabytes of data uh, for online services business. And um, the architect of Bing Search uh, used to work with me in the database space uh, 10 or 11 years ago. Uh, what's been fascinating for me uh, when I run into them every once in a while uh, is that our worlds are converging. Um, they're starting to look uh, more alike than they did, say, five, seven years ago. So. Uh, Data, to me, it's about unlocking the latent potential value of data in all forms, shapes, and sizes. And uh, if you think about information technology all along, it's been about how do we transform signal into information and ultimately into knowledge. And then once we have knowledge, uh, we can then use it to affect action or to derive new insights. Um, and that's what we've been doing. You can even elevate it above that and say that's what the scientific method's about and such. But, um, one of the things I think is really interesting here, and I've been doing uh, sort of database and uh, information management systems for over a quarter of a century, so um, when I started doing this, everything was expensive. The machines were expensive, the disks were expensive. Uh, in fact, even acquiring the data was expensive. So if you unwind all the way back 30, 40, 50 years ago, we were paying people to type uh, information into digital form so we could go feed it to the mainframe and whatnot. You can still pay people to type things in for you, and it's roughly a dollar per kilobyte, whether it's manuscript typing or data entry. So if you think about it that way, uh, it costs you roughly a dollar ten U.S. to have uh, someone type in the Gettysburg address for you. It's about a thousand dollars to have someone type in Moby Dick. Um, and if you scale it all the way up, it's about a trillion dollars a petabyte. Uh, so the key point here is not that you know people are all typing this in uh, on our behalf, but um, there's just a ton of data that's born digital, even analog phenomena like uh, photographs or your conversation on a cell phone. So uh, if you think about where we worked and how we operated several decades ago, we thought about the questions that we wanted to answer first. Then we thought about what's the appropriate information model for it. Then we went around trying to figure out where we could find the data to support and populate the model. Um, and, and then we thought about, you know, early on how we actually got it into digital form. If you think about existing systems, much of the data that we uh, have is in digital form in some place. Uh, but the operation of populating that information model um, is very expensive in and of itself. So. Uh, extract, transform, load uh, to populate new systems, they're all pretty much bespoke to populate that information model. So challenges that people have if they have a new question um, is that you then need to go find someone who's going to change the model, go find the data, transform, load it. Uh, often this takes weeks, uh, if not months. Uh, so the latency, the time to insight, uh, when you have a new question in the way that we've traditionally built systems uh, can be incredibly long. So if you think about turning things around, we're, now we're in a, an environment where we have more signal and data uh, than we know what to do with. Uh, the question is how do we capture it all and how do we effectively turn it into information and knowledge? Um, one of the things that cost us an awful lot in the past was actually building uh, different forms of information models to support different questions. 
Uh, and we spent a lot of time defining the schema, and there's, there are actually several dimensions you could look at this. There's the aspect of the schema uh, that supports the system. Uh, and one way to think about this in, say, a relational database is the logical schema and some sense serves as a scaffold or the spine for physical things that you put on it, like indexes uh, and such, or views, or materialized views, index views. Um, and in the world we're in right now, with more people doing in-memory compressed column stores, there's less of an association between the logical and the physical model. So we're in a much different place uh, where we have an abundance of signal and data. And the question is, how do we turn it into business value? That's, that is the, ultimately the question here. And it really is not about size. Um, one of the things that, uh, and I'll get into this uh, in a slide or two, is these new signals, um, we need to transform them into a different form. And uh, a lot of times we don't know what the questions are up front. So we don't spend the time to build uh, the full information model, the full schema. Now, a critical point here is that this doesn't diminish the value of the full schema or the full information model. It just says that you don't need to do it all up front uh, before you can start to answer the initial questions and explore. So this is a, a big, big shift. So think about this just in the context of we have lots of digital signals available. How do we even validate? How do we know what they're trying to tell us? So. One of the things um, I have done sort of on this uh, journey on big data for the last couple of years is to look at the patterns. Um, and I get an opportunity to go out and talk to a lot of customers, find out what's happening. And I put a lot of stock in cases when I find customers um, basically discovering certain patterns without speaking to others. And quite often, you'll see them go two or three uh, iterations and then uh, come on some patterns. I've put together probably uh, seven, eight, nine uh, patterns in the big data space, and I only have time to talk about two of them uh, today. But I think they sort of have a cut through this and, and make the story. First, the patterns I'll describe is something I call a digital shoebox. Other people call it the data depot. Uh, the idea is you have these signals out there can you just squirrel them away uh, because you don't know what you're going to be using it for later? Um, the second pattern, which is really interesting, is this information production, where you take the data in the digital shoebox and turn it into information. I'll get into this notion of domain shifting um, and the ability to just do transform and load into existing systems. This is a very common pattern that we see. So the, the digital shoebox pattern is about retaining this ambient data that I call, the data that is uh, simply available. Um, and the, there's a, uh, an equation I have below here which didn't render in here. There is a tipping point um, when you actually get to a point where the perceived latent value of the data exceeds the cost to acquire and store it. Let me say that again. So if you realize that the value of this data that doesn't cost anything to have in digital form anymore or to acquire in digital form, if its perceived value is greater than the cost for you to just uh, store uh, and then figure out what to do with it later, then you're at a tipping point. You might as well just hang on to it. Um, and, and so this is one of the very, very common patterns. Uh, and it serves a lot of different purposes. Uh, and I'll describe just one in the next slide here on information production. So the idea is transforming the ambient data into events and states uh, and to cleanse and normal, normalize uh, the ambient data streams and produce information feeds for other systems. Now, um, if I think about this in the context of it's, is it still big data if it fits in your pocket, one of the things that I have uh, been doing since March is walking around with a GPS data logger in my pocket. And I have built my own little digital shoebox and um, I do information production out of that. So I transform my GPS telemetry into uh, events and states, like am I at home, am I at work, uh, have I paused somewhere where I haven't moved in, say, you know, 10 minutes. Um, then what I can do is reverse geocode that. So I'm able now, based upon this, is just go back and do a query like three Saturdays ago, what did I do? Well, I went to Costco, then my wife and I went to Panera Bread, had lunch. And, but this point of uh, transforming from this ambient data, just the raw GPS telemetry, into events and states, 
uh, that begin to look more like the traditional forms of data that I would uh, use in traditional information systems. So another thing that I've done here is to, uh, I've got a little script that I run on my Outlook, uh, uh, my sent mail, uh, which describes uh, when do I send mail and what's my response latency. Now by correlating these two state and event streams, uh, what I'm able to do, and sometimes it's quite depressing, is to figure out how much email I send while I'm at work and how much email I send when I'm at home. And the point is that um, this data uh, and the information production arc that you see this transform going back into the digital shoebox uh, is where a lot of the value is. You, people just start to enrich it into different forms uh, that can serve a variety of uses. Um, and not knowing upfront uh, how you're going to use it. So I think about how it fits together. Um, being able to do something like social media analysis, uh, fraud detection, consumption segmentation, and uh, this transform and load. And I'll speak to these uh, quite, quite briefly. Um, it's really about taking a variety of signals and then turning them into something that a different number of people and different set of systems can consume. So an easy way to think about this is the FICO score or the credit score, where there can be all sorts of exotic uh, computations that go into computing that one number. Uh, and on the consumption side, all you need to know is how to ascribe meaning to the number. So if it's greater than 650, I'll grant the, uh, the loan, and if it's lower, I won't. Um, same thing with social media analysis, being able to uh, come up with a sentiment score. Here's another couple of interesting points that I've uh, discovered. As we look into fraud detection in financial services, um, I see a pattern where there are financial services companies who are bringing fraud detection back in-house. Uh, whereas they had been using third parties to do this uh, on their behalf, and they're bringing things back in-house. Uh, same thing with uh, web analytics and Clickstream for uh, commerce sites. And when I ask them the reason for that, it's uh, typically twofold. One, these, uh, the value that they realize out of these systems quite often lands quite near the top line or the bottom line of the business. So they figure if they can do a better job of it by knowing their space better, um, it's going to have a, a material effect on the business. And the second reason, which is probably more important for thinking how the market plays out, uh, many of these companies have additional signals uh, that they have that the third party is not using uh, in these calculations. Uh, and the reasons for that can be several fold. One, that the third party doesn't have a means to incorporate it into their model, or in some cases because the, the data is considered proprietary and it's not something that these uh, companies are willing to let out, but it's something they're willing to in, uh, incorporate into the model if they're doing it themselves in-house. Uh, another quick example, consumption segmentation. Uh, what we have done is uh, there's a pattern that I, I don't have in the deck here, just due to time, that we call uh, monitor, mine, and manage. Uh, this is a closed loop pattern where you'll collect a bunch of data in the digital shoebox. You do some analysis over it to produce a model could be the fraud model. Uh, in the case that we had done here at Microsoft, um, it was an audience segmentation model. And then we installed that model real time into a complex event processing system. Uh, the one we have is called Stream Insight. Uh, and then what you can do is things is reject suspected fraudulent transactions real time uh, or be able to segment uh, you know, folks into one class or another as they're using the site. So uh, if you're in the display ad business, you can imagine that knowing that some Someone searching for particular automobiles and local car dealerships is perhaps a hundred times more valuable to you uh, in that moment than it would be an hour and a thousand times more valuable than it would be, you know, the following week. So um, this is, you know, very, very fascinating space, uh, and there's a tremendous amount of new value uh, to be realized from it. Last thing I'll talk to is just uh, something that's a little bit um, less exotic. Being able to transform and load systems from these digital shoeboxes uh, and to produce uh, snapshots of data for an analysis to support that, uh, to be able to populate systems uh, directly from the digital shoebox, that's another uh, very important aspect. Um, you can go look at the company, well, Yahoo is populating a 24 terabyte analysis services cube uh, by doing this. Uh, there's a company called Clout that is using, uh, doing social analytics and providing uh, influence scores. Uh, they're also doing you know, the same thing, a very common pattern, just using the digital shoebox to support uh, a set of production systems by just pulling stuff out of it.
So in the, these are the examples that I described here. Uh, the final point I'll make uh, on this audience intelligence uh, thing that we had in-house in is that there was an existing system, which is more of a batch system, uh, which would classify people over time. But when we worked with the online services folks to build this uh, monitor, mine, and manage pattern, and then they use Stream Insight to basically uh, classify real time, they wanted to immediately put it into production. Uh, and we told them, that's no, crazy. We're six months away from you know, shipping it. And they said, no, you don't understand. That, that the value that they would realize from it was so great that if it ran an hour or two a day, um, they'd be ahead of where they were and they'd just fall back to the other system. Uh, so this immediacy, this you know, time value component, the time to insight, um, is incredibly valuable in a, in a large number of domains. Um, so that's another aspect of where the value is here. So if I just summarize, you know, it, the value in these ambient data uh, in my opinion, is less about the size, uh, but more about the ability to transform it into new forms of information, new signals. And one of the things to keep in mind is quite often uh, that transformation leads to information that can just uh, feed what looks like more of a traditional information management system. Uh, so from that perspective, uh, they can be very complementary. So, uh, and as I've walked through that piece with a number of customers and spent an hour or two with them. Um, it's really liberating. In, in more cases than not, uh, by the end of an hour or an hour and a half conversation, they'll be able to come up with their own examples uh, to be able to you know, transform and go from, from one uh, state to another and figure out how they're going to use it within their business. So um, with that, I believe that is the uh, you know, final slide here, what Microsoft is doing. If, the thing that's been interesting for me, and it's kind of an interesting aspect of working here, is that we're a significant first-party player in the big data space, uh, hundreds of petabytes for our online services. Uh, as you can well imagine, we have a significant uh, Microsoft research investment in advanced analytics, which we're bringing to bear. Um, and uh, we're also investing, I'm sure uh, people are looking at Hadoop, you know what's going on there. Uh, we're investing in Hadoop success, uh, building high-scale connectors to and from Hadoop to Microsoft SQL Server, uh, and working with the community to develop a great version of Hadoop for Windows. And as Hadoop crosses the chasm into more commercial acceptance, uh, being able to uh, do integration, say, with Active Directory or you know, your other security policies uh, for those people who use Windows throughout, you know, have it just be a great citizen there. Uh, that's really what we want to do. And in, in terms of our ultimate goal, it's about demystifying big data uh, and bringing it to the masses. And that doesn't mean we're going to take everybody who sits in front of Excel and turn them into a, a data scientist, uh, but connecting the dots there uh, and allowing the data scientists a way to engage with them through things like our data market um, is, is another piece of the puzzle. So uh, more information in terms of how we're uh, doing things here, you can go look at uh, the SQL Server site that's listed here. Um, and we have, uh, in fact, uh, done a number of announcements recently relative to Hadoop. Uh, there is content that you could find from our, uh, our past conference a month or two ago uh, on this and how we're thinking about it. Uh, so I want to thank you for uh, the time and uh, hope that um, that's uh, uh, serves it. Now, I, I'm looking here for a couple of questions. So we have one about how does uh, SQL Server integrate with non-SQL data stores? Um, and, uh, and there's a question around Cassandra. Uh, so we are definitely looking at um, how we work with them and what we do more uh, within our own data platform. Now, one of the things that we had designed, I've been working uh, on SQL Server here at Microsoft since 1994. Uh, one of the things that we had designed a long time ago is a fairly sophisticated distributed query mechanism. Um, we hadn't put a lot of energy into that over the last couple of releases. Um, but it's something that in this new space uh, is incredibly important for us. And um, if you look at our parallel data warehouse product, if you look at what we've done in a compressed column store, uh, say in the VertiPak and the new analysis services engine, uh, being able to pull data from one of these stores, operate on it, uh, particularly when you get into some of the uh, analysis uh, and computational aspects, um, that work that we had done earlier on distributed query will come back and serve as well. 
Um, another question here, what types of big data skills are lacking the most in the current market? Uh, I believe, and, and this is no surprise to anyone who's looking at this, that uh, uh, data science and the data scientists themselves are, are going to continue to be a rare commodity. Um, and we see a lot of large corporations, ourselves included, uh, snapping them up. Uh, my son has just graduated from college, and one of his best friends graduated last year uh, in a, a program in, in data science. Uh, and he described that uh, folks in his group, um, the data scientists, were the only ones on campus who had multiple job offers last year. Um, the other thing I would say is that there's a fair bit of you know, confusion around where the value is and is this going to displace traditional data warehousing and you know, BI technologies as it augment them. Uh, I see it much more complementary. Um, there are some interesting patterns relative to having uh, this digital shoebox surrounded more by uh, smaller marts and such, um, but in the large, I, it's mostly complementary to me. So with that, I think I've uh, addressed the questions and uh, I'll wrap. Okay.